Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd, qala l-imam al-ghazali adabu al-khuruji ila al-masjidi. Adabu al-khuruji ila al-masjidi. So we've realized and we've studied the ghusl and the, the wudu in the morning. And once this happens, then Imam Ghazali is talking about the etiquettes of leaving for the masjid. So he says, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِنْ طَهَارَتِكَ فَصَلِّ فِي بَيْتِكَ رَكْعَتَيِ الْفَجْرِ إِنْ كَانَ الْفَجْرُ قَدْ طَلَعَ كَذَلِكَ كَانَ يَفْعَلُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ثُمَّ تَوَجَّهْ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ Once you've finished performing your purification, once you've purified yourself, whether you've had to do ghusl or wudu, then perform in your home, perform in your home two rakats of the Fajr Sunnah prayer. The two sunnah, the two rakats of Sunnah. That is if the Fajr has already begun, if the Fajr time has already begun. That means if the Subha, subha Sadiq, which is the true dawn, has already set in. That's the, t- that's the beginning of the time of Fajr, which is this brightness that comes into the sky. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. What the Prophet ﷺ used to do is that in the later portions of the night, he would be performing tahajjud prayer, which were eight rak'ats. And these eight rak'ats, they would be followed by the three rak'ats of witr. And then he would make two, what they call rak'ataini khafifataini, two light rak'ats. That means he would actually sit down and perform two, two rak'ats of nafil prayer, just extra prayer. And that's why you'll see that after the witr, there's two rak'ats. And this is actually in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ used to do that. Then after that, he would lie down for a while. He would relax for a while until the fajr time would come in. When the fajr time would come in, then he would get up and make his two sunnas. And then after that, he would go to the masjid for the fard prayer. He would lie down and people would probably think that he's sleeping, but what he was, according to the scholars, what, they, what they're saying is that he used to lie down to, uh, basic, to basically come down from the different types of elevations or the elevation that he had um, gone up to. Because what you see is that there's some people who say this is a sunnah in its own. What they do is they come into the masjid and make two rakats of sunnah and then they all kind of lie down for a while. The point is that there's a reason the Prophet ﷺ did this. Yes, if you've been awake all night, tahajjud, and then after that you lie down for a while after your, after your tahajjud prayer ends and then you start your fajr prayer afterwards, then that's absolutely fine. But coming and making this like a, a kind of specific sunnah where you've just woken up for fajr, you made two rakats and then you lie down for a while on your side, that's not necessarily what the ulama have encouraged in that regard. And one of the reasons the ulama give for the Prophet ﷺ lying down at that time is because in his tahajjud which was his closest time one of his closest times that he would be intimate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then to come back to this world type of thing you know to come back to this world he would lie down on the ground to gain some what they call ardiya which is uh, some earthliness in that sense and Allah knows best but uh, you make the sunnah prayers in the home as far as possible and then, ثُمَّ تَوَجَّهْ إِلَى إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ Then you intend the path to the masjid. Then you go to the masjid. So when you have completed your purification, pray in your house the two rakahs of the dawn prayer. Should the dawn have already broken? This is what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. Then betake yourself to the masjid. وَلَا تَدَعِ الصَّلَاةَ فِي جَمَاعَةٍ لَا سِيَّمَا صَلَاةَ الصُّبْحِ فَصَلَاةُ الْجَمَاعَةِ تَفْضُلُ صَلَاةَ الْفَذِّ so we've got a number of things here. One is, let's understand that one of the reasons for praying at home is the Prophet ﷺ actually commanded that لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورا which is do not make your homes into maqbaras, into, cerem- uh, into cemeteries or graveyards. What that meant is, one meaning of that is that the Prophet ﷺ said that don't deprive your home of salat, you know, which is a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and don't just perform everything in the masjid, but your nafil prayers and so on should be performed at home. The other thing he's saying here is, وَلَا تَدَعِ الصَّلَاةِ فِي جَمَاعَةٍ Do not 
abandon the prayer in jama'ah, the fajr prayer in jama'ah. La siyama salat subhi Especially the fajr prayer. That's something he says, make sure you pray in the masjid, because there's no excuse for that one. It's just the only excuse that you could come up with is that I can't wake up. But, you know, we have to make arrangements to wake up. Get somebody to wake you up. Use three alarm clocks if you have to. Whatever the case is, there's different ways of waking up if you really want to. You know, the one way to test yourself is if you've got a flight the next morning at that time, what are you going to do? How are you going to arrange for yourself to wake up? Or are you just going to wake up? But one of the secrets of waking up early, I've, I've noticed, is that when you're young, it's okay for you to go to sleep late and then, and then wake up you can do it. Even if you sleep 2 o'clock, it's much easier to wake up. The older you get, the more difficult it becomes sometimes. Wallahu alam, I guess the, biolog- uh, the biolog- uh, biological makeup of everybody is very different. So it's, it, it, it would depend individually on different people, but you could talk to your doctor and so on. But one thing about waking up early is to go to sleep early. Go to sleep early, that should help to wake up early. I, I used to... I used to... Uh, not believe that I used to actually reject that for a long time but actually it's very true it's actually very true that going to sleep early will give you that night of sleep that you need your six or seven hours and then after that it's much easier to get up and if if you have a good amount of sleep eight hours and you still aren't able to get up then it may be just some maybe some deficiency of iron or something else and at the end of the day it's a dua that helps as well it's that, that's a, one of the most effective means that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bring us close to him he's going to make it easy for us but we have to ask him so do not abandon the salat in jama'ah now obviously here I'm talking more to the men because it's more necessary for them to go to the masjid um, for the sisters it's okay to go to the masjid although the hadith is clear about the salat being better at home but uh, the emphasis is definitely here for the, for the men to do this. They have no excuse unless they, they've got some genuine shari excuse for themselves. La siyama salat al-subhi, especially the fajr prayer. For salat al-jama'ati taftulu salat al-fadhi bi sab'i wa ishreena daraja. Because salat alone, salat, sorry, salat al-jama'a is superior to, is superior to salat alone 20 by 27 times. فَإِن كُنْتَ تَتَسَاهَلُ فِي مِثْلِ هَذَا الْرِبْحِ فَأَيُّ فَائِدَةٍ لَكَ فِي طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ But Imam Ghazali brings it back to the discussion. This whole issue of going to Fajr prayer, he brings it back to the discussion here, is that if you are going to be lazy about this, about this Prophet, remember he talked about the capital and the Prophet, the capital is fulfilling the Fara'id, the Prophet was how you build on that, so the capital here is the Fajr prayer. You have to perform that anyway. But you have to build on that by... You, you have to actually build on that by performing it in a way that you get more reward and that's by doing it in the masjid. So he says here, then betake yourself to the mosque. Do not omit congregational prayer, especially in the morning. Congregational prayer is seven is 27 times better than individual prayer. If you are lenient about a spiritual gain of this kind, what benefit will you have in seeking knowledge? So again, that's what I said. He brought it close to back home to this discussion that you're talking about studying knowledge here. And if you are not performing these extra deeds to uh, performing these deeds to gain that profit and that guidance and to get to the end of guidance then there's really not much benefit in studying the deen if you are not doing these things which are important subhanallah wa indama thamaratul ilmi al amalu bihi because the fruits of knowledge is to act upon it fruits of knowledge is to act upon it and this is part of that فَإِن فَإِذَا سَعِيتَ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ فَمْشِ عَلَى هَيْنَةٍ وَتُؤْدَةٍ وَلَا تَعْجَلْ He says, if you are lenient about a spiritual gain of this kind, what benefit will you have in seeking knowledge? The fruit of knowledge is only in the activity based on it. When you walk to the masjid, walk easily and calmly. So relax in your walk and do not hurry. Say as you go the following dua. So he's saying to take it easy in the morning. The morning is that kind of a time where everything seems to be a bit more relaxed. Go with that. Go early so you don't have to hurry. That's the point. A lot of us may probably drive to work, uh, drive to the Fajr prayer. Again, try to drive slowly unless you're trying to go at the last minute. And in that case, you know, we should attempt to 
do it early. وَقُلْ فِي طَرِيقِكْ Say in your way to the masjid, on your way to the masjid, make the following dua. اللهم إني أسألك بحق السائلين عليك وبحق الراغبين إليك وبحق ممشاي هذا إليك فإني لم أخرج أشرا ولا بطرا ولا رياء ولا سمعة بل خرجت اتقاء سخطك وابتغاء مرضاتك فأسألك أن تنقذني من النار وأن تدخلني الجنة وأن تدخلني الجنة وأن تغفر لي ذنوبي فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت now there's going to be many du'as that he'll mention. And it's good to use these du'as as far as possible. O oh Allah, by those who beseech you, and by those who entreat you, and by this walk of mine to you, I swear to you that I set out neither light-heartedly nor heedlessly, neither from hypocrisy nor from desire to be well spoken of, but out of fear for you, out of fear for thy anger and longing to please you, I ask you to deliver me from the hellfire and to forgive my sins, and there is none that forgives sins except you. So that's the dua that is made on the way to the masjid. And you're actually making a form of tawassul here where you're saying that I'm asking you by those who ask you. So the others who ask you, I'm asking you by those who ask you and likewise by those who entreat you and by my walking towards you that you make this purely for your sake and I'm not doing this for the for the wrong thing. Um, I'm not sure if this dua is in hadith or not but again it's something that's uh, related from maybe the scholars. I'm not sure if it's from the hadith. If somebody has Kitab al Athkar, which is Imam Nawawi's book, I would, uh, I'll try to check it up, but uh, let me give it as a, a task for the class as well. That if anybody has Kitab al Athkar, what they can do is by tomorrow check all of these duas to see if they're in Kitab al Athkar or in one of the other books like al Hasan al-Haseen and so on, and what their reference is. That should uh, help us all. If I don't get a chance to do it, let's see if somebody else can do it. Anybody volunteer to do it? Who, does somebody have Kitab al -Adkar? Okay, great. So we have at least two people, three people here. So uh, you can all do it, and uh, we'll, ex you know, we'll find out tomorrow. So we'll go through this at the end of the class tomorrow. Okay, let's start the next chapter, which is Adabu Dukhul al Masjid ila Tulu al Shamsi. Now, we've got to the Masjid, the way to enter the Masjid and to spend your time until Tulu al Shams, which is the sunrise. So now, he, again, he's splitting up the time and he is categorizing the time again, which is very good because he really puts it into perspective for us. فَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ دُخُولَ الْمَسْجِدِ فَقَدِّمْ رِجْلَكَ الْيُمْنَى فإذا أردت دخول المسجد فقدم رجلك اليمنى وقل اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وسلم اللهم اغفر لي ذنوبي وافتح لي أبواب رحمتك So I know definitely part of this is from the hadith Part of this is definitely from the hadith And this is the dua that you perform That you, you say when you enter the masjid ومهما رأيت في المسجد من يبيع فقل لا أربح, لا أربح الله تجارتك Well the dua that you say when you enter the masjid on the etiquette of entering into the masjid this is chapter 7 when you are about to enter the masjid do so with your right foot first do so with your right foot first and say oh Allah bless Muhammad and the family members of Muhammad and his companions and give them peace oh Allah forgive me my sins and open to me the gates of your mercy now, I just want to say a few things about that number one when you're entering the masjid, there's two things here. One is that you're actually enter, entering the structure, entering the building. You can enter with your right hand, uh, right foot as well there because you're entering into the general structure of the masjid. The other thing is to enter the masjid itself, which is actually the prayer hall area that has been designated as the, san the sanctuary or the special place that is sanctified for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala up to the seventh heaven. It's a masjid and below to the lowest level of the earth. 
it is a masjid and nothing uh, uh, nothing can be done in there except things which are appropriate for the masjid so let us understand that that when you enter that place as well you should also make sure that you you enter with the right foot in fact that's probably where what this is related to but even when you're entering the masjid you can enter with your right foot because you're definitely entering into a better better place which houses the prayer hall the the sanctified area than what's outside meaning than what's outside the masjid number two this dua is actually very very significant Allah especially Allah which is actually from the hadith because that's the dua that you you say when you enter the masjid when you come out of the masjid we say Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. You say, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. Now, there's two things we're doing here. When we're entering, we're saying, Allahumma ftahli, O oh Allah, open for me the doors of your mercy. And when you're exiting, you're going to say, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. O oh Allah, I ask you for your favor, for your grace. The ulama have explained this, that rahmah, mercy, is what you need in the masjid. Because that's when you get your du'as accepted. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers you and envelopes you with His mercy. That's what you need when you're in this worshipping state. When you're going outside, you're asking for His fadl and His grace and His favor. And some ulama have actually explained this to mean that you're going to go out, you're more, you're, you, know, you could be going out to earn. You could be going out to earn and so on. So when you're doing that, you are actually... When you're going outside, what you're doing is you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you in your earnings. So if you're, whenever we're going out of the masjid, we're asking, we're making this dua. Now remember, this is a, probably a time of acceptance because we've just performed the salat and with the jama'ah in the masjid. And if the salat was accepted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepted. The angels have told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had been around this, have been around this gathering. If our dua is accepted, we'll get barakah in our life as well. We'll get barakah in our class. We'll get barakah in our studies. We'll get barakah in our business, in, in our work, in our employment, whatever it is. So this is a longer dua that Imam Ghazali is mentioning. But if you notice that the first part of it is just a salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next part, Allahumma khfilli dhunubi, which is also from the hadith, which is, O oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness from my sins. And open for me the doors of your mercy. With the next thing, he indicates towards two hadith. One is that when you see somebody in the masjid who is selling something, say, God, make your trafficking unprofitable. Make, make, may Allah make your business unprofitable because that's not the place to promote your business. Now, just imagine, just imagine if it was permissible and in our day and age with where promotions and advertisements and, you know, the whole industry of advertising has gone to, imagine what the state of the masjid would be. You'd probably have billboards in the masjid, especially in the larger masjids. People would be fighting with each other, competing with each other to get the best billboards in, in the masjid. Right? So, Alhamdulillah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it forbidden to promote anybody's business in the masjid, right? In general, it should be avoided throughout uh, unless it's something related to the masjid, right? Or there's a separate area which has been designated for multi-purpose or whatever, but definitely not in the masjid itself. Not in the masjid itself. Unless... For example, there's something specific being sold which is of benefit to the Muslims, right? Which is of benefit to the Muslims and the Imam, for example, makes an announcement that, you know, there's going to be somebody selling hijabs outside because he knows that the sisters then need hijabs or there's going to be books being sold outside because there's, you know, the people need this book and it's important that they have this book or something of that nature which is very specific, which has definitely something to do with the deen in that sense and there's a requirement for it. So you have to be very careful in this regard. And then the next hadith, the, the next thing he talks about is if somebody's lost something, again the masjid is not a place to make an announcement. The masjid itself is not a place to make announcements of, 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 lost, of lost articles that if 
somebody has found such and such a pen or such and such a wallet, then you know, please give it back. Yes, you can put that on the notice board outside in the in the passageway or in the hallway or in the multi-purpose room or whatever it is. That's fine. Those places can be designated and they they allow such a thing to happen, but not in the masjid itself because that should be purely for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Likewise, there's a big misconception, especially in America, in in some parts of America, that the masjid is actually like the social center that you can do whatever you want in there as long as it's community related that's absolutely wrong there should be a separate community center right the masjid in itself the sanctuary the the main area that is purely as the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as he explained that this is for the tilawa of the quran this is for remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to pray in the word masjid comes from sajda which means to prostrate so that the masjid means the place of prostration and that's the idea of this so he says that if you see somebody looking for a lost animal, say, may Allah not restore your stray. I mean, that's how se- severe this is. This is in accordance with the command of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَإِذَا دَخَلْتَ الْمَسْجِدْ فَلَا تَجْلِسْ حَتَّى تُصَلِّيَ رَكْعَتَيِ التَّحِيَّةِ when you enter the masjid, then do not sit until you perform the two rakats of the welcome prayer to the masjid, tahiyyatul masjid. Now this prayer is sunnah. You get lots of reward for performing this as long as it's performed before sitting down. If you sit down, then you've lost that chance. So it's before you sit down because that's when you welcome the masjid. However, if there's a sunnah prayer or a fard prayer that you have to perform as soon as you enter, then this you'll, you'll be rewarded the reward of this prayer incorporated into that prayer. Uh, you should have the intention though. So if you're going to come in and make a sunnah prayer anyway, then you're going to be rewarded for the, for the tahiyyatul masjid. Uh, for the Tahiyyatul Masjid. What Imam Ghazali is saying here though, is that when you enter the Masjid, the, make sure that you perform the two rakats of Tahiyya. Now this is the Shafi opinion that in the Fajr, during the Fajr time, you see because Imam Ghazali has already made us make the Sunnah prayer at home. So if we made the Sunnah prayer at home, then we go inside the Masjid. When we go inside the Masjid, right? If we're going to make the Tahiyyatul Masjid there, then that means for the Hanafi school, that's makru. It's it's undesirable for them to perform any other sunnah or nafal prayer during the time of Fajr, other than the two sunnahs of Fajr. You could, neither before the neither before you make the Fajr sunnah, neither after you make the Fajr sunnah before the fard, or neither after the fard can you make any sunnah or nafal prayer. You can make qada prayers. You can make makeup prayers, that's fine, in the Hanafi school as well. So what he's saying here is based on the Shafi school, that once you've entered a masjid, then make sure that you make the tahiyyatul masjid. Unless, فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ صَلَّيْتَ فِي بَيْتِكَ رَكْعَةَ الْفَجْرِ فَيُجْزِئُكَ أَدَاؤُهُمَا عَنِ التَّحِيَّةِ If you haven't performed your two rakats of sunnah, fajr, at home, and you came to the masjid without performing them, then you're performing them as soon as, as soon as you enter into the masjid. If you perform them, that will suffice you from the, the two rakats of tahiyyah. Going back to the issue of the masjid, that's absolutely right, that the laws of the masjid and its sanctity, etc., that relate to masjid that has been designated as a proper masjid, that is purchased property as an endowment not a rented office space or not a rented house or something of that nature, which we should still try to treat as far as possible like a masjid. But the point is that it's really those places which are completely designated forever to be a masjid. That's what a true masjid is. So yes, that's a good point that you brought up there. فَإِذَا فَرَقْتَ مِنَ الرَّكْعَتَيْنِ فَنْوِ الْإِعْتِكَافِ وَدْعُوا بِمَا دَعَى بِهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بَعْدَ رَكْعَتَيِ الْفَجْرِ once you've performed, once you've completed your two rakats, now intend i'tikaf. So again, this is another good point that every time you go into the masjid, whatever you're going there for, intend to do nafal i'tikaf. You'll be rewarded an extra reward for free. فَيُجْزِئُكَ أَدَاؤُهُمَا عَنِ التَّحِيَّةِ I'm sorry. وَدْعُوا بِمَا دَعَى And then make the duas that the Prophet ﷺ made after the two rakats of fajr. So he is mentioning the rest of the du'as. He's saying that these are what the Prophet ﷺ made. And again, those uh, students who said they were going to check this out, try to find these as well if possible. You'll be, inshallah, Allah will reward you greatly for that. وَقُلْ أَلَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْأَلُكَ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِكَ تَهْدِي بِهَا قَلْبِي 
وتجمع بها شملي وتلم بها شعثي وترد بها ألفتي وتصلح بها ديني وتحفظ بها غائبي وترفع بها شاهدي وتزكي بها عملي وتبيض بها وجهي وتلقبني بها وتلقيني بها رشدي وتعصمني بها من كل سوء So now it's just a number of du'as that he's mentioning here. He says, O oh Allah, I beseech you for mercy from thee to guide my heart, to settle my affairs, to order my disorder, to repel temptation, to reform my conduct, to preserve my secret thought, to raise up my visible act, which is to preserve my secret thought, which is that my secrets are not told to everybody. Those things which need to be kept hidden, they keep concealed. My bad points remain concealed. To raise my visible, raise up my visible act, to purify my works, to make my face bright and white, to inspire me to walk straight or on the straight path, to direct me aright, to satisfy all my needs and to keep me from all evil. So these hadiths, these du'as are definitely mentioned from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But I'm not sure if they mentioned to be read at this time. Imam Ghazali just says that these are the du'as that the Prophet sallallahu made. So this, these du'as, these words are definitely found in the hadith. Allahumma inni as'aluka imanan da'iman yubashiru qalbi wa as'aluka yaqeenan sadiqan hatta a'lamu annahu lan yusibani illa ma katabtahu alayya wa raddini bima qasamtahu li. Oh Allah. I beseech you for pure faith to fill my heart. Pure faith, everlasting faith to fill my heart. And I ask you for true certainty, yaqeen and sadiqan, until I want so much certainty and conviction in my faith that I may know that nothing will befall me except what you have written down for me. So you're asking for a strong conviction in your faith and that's very important and for glad acceptance of what you have allotted to me. That I accept gladly what you have allotted to me, and I don't complain about that. Allahumma a'tini imanan sadiqan wa yaqeenan laysa ba'dahu kufrun wa rahmatan analu biha sharafa karamatika fi dunya wal akhirah. O Allah, I beseech you for true and certain faith which no unbelief follows. So I want such iman that there's no unbelief after it. And I beseech you for your mercy, whereby I may receive the privilege of your regard in this world and the next. And in that regard is another dua, Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal waha, which is, O oh Allah, do not cause deviance in my heart after you have guided it aright. اللهم إني أسألك الصبر عند القضاء والفوز عند اللقاء ومنازل الشهداء وعيش السعداء والنصر على الأعداء ومرافقة الأنبياء Oh Allah, I beseech you for patience with destiny, for salvation in the encounter on the day of judgment and for the mansions of the martyrs and the life of the blessed, the life of the fortunate for succor against enemies and the companionship of the prophets. اللهم إني أنزل بك حاجتي وإن ضعف رأيي وقصر عملي وافتقرت إلى رحمتك فأسألك يا قاضي الأمور ويا شافي الصدور كما تجير بين البحور أن تجيرني من عذاب السعير ومن دعوة الثبور ومن فتنة القبور Oh Allah, I come to you in my need. My thought is weak and I fall short in my actions. I am in dire need of your mercy. I therefore beseech you, O judge of all things, O healer of men's breasts, that as you do rescue from the midst of the seas, you would rescue me from the punishment of the fire, the torment of the tombs, and the imprecation of destruction. O Allah, and wherever my thought has been too weak, my action too imperfect, and my intention and desire too ineffective to achieve some good, you have promised to one of your servants or, or some good you give to one of your creatures, I pray and beseech you for that, O Lord of the worlds, which is, Allahumma wa ma qasara anhu ra'yi wa da'ufa anhu amali wa lam 
تبلغه نيتي أو أمنيتي من خير وعدته أحد من عبادك أو خير أنت معته أحد من خلقك فإني أرغب إليك فيه وأسألك يا رب العالمين And then اللهم اجعلنا هادين مهتدين غير ضالين ولا مضلين حربا لأعدائك وسلما لأولائك نحب بحبك الناس ونعادي بعداوتك من خالفك من خلقك اللهم هذا الدعاء وعليك الإجابة وهذا الجهد وعليك التكلان وإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم So these are the rest of the duas that we're doing which is Oh Allah make me from those who guide others and who are guided aright Do not make us to err and lead others astray at war with your enemies and at peace with your friends loving men with your love and hostile with your hostility meaning we love others for your sake and when we have hatred for somebody or when we when we actually act in an unloving way to somebody it's because of the love of you as well it's because you don't like such a person so our decision about the way we deal with others is based on what you have commanded us to do Oh God, this is my prayer, but it is for you to answer. Like, I'm making the prayer, but you have to answer it. We're asking you to answer it. This is my utmost endeavor, but in you is my trust. So although I feel that I may have slackened out or weakened out, but this is the best that I'm trying to do, but I have faith in you, and I have trust in you that you'll be able to answer it. And we are gods, and to Him we are returning. There is no power, no might, save with Allah, the High and Mighty. Inshallah, we'll carry on the rest of the du'as tomorrow because our time is up and there's a few questions that we need to take care of. Okay, there was a question here. I'm sorry if I missed this, but if we pray two rakats of sunnah and uh, off fajr and then lay down before praying the fard, will this be sufficient to achieve the sunnah or the Prophet ﷺ would do? Or is this for tahajjud? Yeah, the ulama, a lot of the ulama have explained that this was something the Prophet ﷺ himself did. Um, after performing the Hajjud and then a Sunnah prayer, and then he would relax for a while because he would make his Sunnah prayer in the beginning of the time, and then after that he would relax until he would go to lead the Fajr, the fourth prayer. So that's the main thing. If somebody does it after making the Hajjud prayer, then they would definitely be following the Sunnah, but it's not necessary to do it at all otherwise. Whether it's permissible or not, I guess it, it would be permissible unless. Uh, I guess it would be permissible because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did do it. But uh, many scholars have actually considered this to be specifically an action, uh, s- uh, specifically for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that he would do this for a particular reason. Plus, the fact is that he would actually sleep. But uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sleep was, as somebody said, that you know we heard you snoring, because then he would just make the prayer afterwards. Uh, he said, "My I sleep, but my heart does not." So th- there's a number of things in this hadith that we have to. You know, look at um, my mother-in-law. What is this? My mother-in-law. Irfan Sab, what is this? My mother-in-law. This a mistake or what? You mean inside the masjid prayer or just in the main structure? I think I talked about that. These rules only apply to a masjid, which is waqf. Yes, we talked about that. I looked at the shifa, and this is what it had a footnote for the ten things of fitra. Great, somebody found it here. Hadith of Aisha radiyallahu anha, clipping the mustache, letting the beard grow, using the siwak, snuffing water into the nose, basically that's cleaning the nose out, clipping the nails, washing the knuckles, plucking the armpit hair and shaving the pubic hair. Where's the rest of them? Oh, there you go. Making a stinja. The narrator forgot the tenth, but thought it was rinsing the mouth. Yeah, that's right. There's a difference of opinion about the the fourth one. And one version of the hadith has circumcision instead of the beard. So yes, th- these are the ten possibilities because there's two or three narrations that have slight differences. Regarding the two units which you mentioned earlier, Holy Prophet ﷺ used to perform a dua after tahajjud prayer. Can we still offer these two units at tahajjud time even though one has already performed them at Isha prayer to follow the sunnah? Of course, at tahajjud time, you can make any number of rakats that you want. Um, you can make your eight rakats, and then you can sit down make two rakats if you want to. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. So, because it's just another nafal prayer, and nafal prayers, you can actually sit anyway. 
So all of your nafal prayers you could actually sit, but you'd get less reward. Um, Sheikh Hussein Ahmed Madani, the great scholar of the subcontinent, who was sent by the British to a prison in Malta as well, he would actually always sit down and perform these two rakats of uh, nafal prayer after the witter, after the witter of Isha. And when somebody asked him that, why do you do this? I mean, I don't think he was that old at that time. He said, look, I know that I get more reward if I stand up. That in nafal prayer, you get more reward if you stand up and pray. But the only reason that I sit and pray is because the, this was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to do this, and that is more beloved to me. So there's uh, absolutely nothing wrong in, in doing that at any time, anyway. But uh, this, that was something specific with after the witr. Would you like us to look up the du'as up to this point or only the ones mentioned today? Actually, you could look up as many du'as as you want. So, I mean, if you've got time on your hands and you're, you know, mashallah, you, you know, want to uh, go forth in this, then you can carry on. I mean, you can look up as many of the du'as as you as you want to. I guess one of the ways to do this as well would be to actually just read the Adhkar or Al-Histun Haseen, those general du'as that are mentioned there. And then when you come across some of these in the future, you could also relate back to them as well. Regarding the witr, I read in a book that some people pray witr before sleeping and then make an even number of rakats of tahajjud before fajr. Others pray witr before sleeping, pray one rakah, then an even number of rakahs and then one rakah. What should one do? Well, you know, there's a difference of opinion between the different madhabs as to how many rakats is witr. Witr is actually three rakats, but it's actually it's supposed to be three rakats. Is this difference of opinion how you perform them? The Hanafis say that you have to do them together. You can't make a salam in between and then make one rakah separately. Because they have a hadith which says, Raka'atun wahidatun butayra, which is that a single rakah is considered to be a tail cut off, a, a kind of an incomplete prayer. So you have to do them together. All the other madhabs as well, when they say that you make your prayer and they allow, the witr prayer, and they allow you to make just one rakah, they actually say that you should perform two rakats uh, of shaf before that was shaf'i wal watr or I'm not sure where they take that exactly from, but they say you should make two rakats before that as well. And there's absolutely no problem in the other madhabs as well making it together for them, but um, they they allow just one rakah separately. So now the thing is that the tahajjud prayer was eight rakats, two, 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 right? So in eight rakats, four times two rakats. Then after that, the Prophet ﷺ would make another two rakats and then one rakat together. Where Hanafi say that he used to do these three together. The hadiths which normally say that, oh, he used to make two rakats, two rakats, two rakats, and then when he would see that the fajr time is coming in, then he would, he would make an extra rakat. Well, that doesn't mean that he would make an extra rakat separately. When he would add that on to the last of his two rakats prayer, uh, prayer. And then after that he would make two very short light rakats sitting down. So that's that's the way it happens. Now normally in the hadith it says to make the witr the last of your prayers. But even after that the Prophet ﷺ used to make these two light prayers. Now about the witr, if you performed it at night, it's still perfectly fine to get up in the morning in a uh, tahajjud time and make your tahajjud prayer. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yes, if you know that you're definitely going to wake up, then in that case it's best for you to leave your witr until later. The only reason I'm saying that if you have to make your witr prayer early, uh, if you have to pray, make your witr prayer early because if you're not sure you'll wake up because you don't want to miss your witr prayer because that's more necessary, it's wajib to do that the, nafl, the, sun, the tahajjud prayer is just a sunnah it's a, it's a nafl prayer in a sense so uh, you, you can pray it in any, any order you want but it's best to make the witr prayer last if that's going to be, uh, if that's possible for you to do about the two rakats after entering the masjid, if someone makes wudu inside the masjid, there are two rakats of wudu as well. Do you pray two, four? Two for the wudu and two entering masjid in order. You don't have to make four. The best thing would be to actually make four, but you don't have to because the tahiyatul masjid, tahiyatul wudu, uh, the welcoming the masjid and, 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 the, and the wudu prayer, those can combine together. And likewise, if you just had to make the sunnah prayer of dhuhr, for example, four rakats, and that's all the time you had, then there's absolutely, uh, inshallah, we should get the reward of both the tahiyatul wudu and the tahiyatul masjid and, and the sunnah prayer as long as you know you have all of those intentions you get on your intention in this case when you can combine them together if we have prayed two sunnah of fajr in the house and arrive at the masjid can we still pray tahiyatul masjid is it makru then how do you get the reward for tahiyatul masjid 
Yeah, you can't. You can't make it. You, you, it's not. It's not permissible. It's makru. And basically, I, I guess the way you should get reward for tahiyatul masjid is that if it's your normal habit to make tahiyatul masjid, and in this case you're not able to because of the timing, then I guess Allah Subhanahu wa Taala should give us the reward for that because. We, we say he's the one who's telling us that this is the makru time to pray, but had it been the correct time, we would have done, we would have, we would have performed it. So, inshallah, in that regard, it should be fine. Unless you get to the masjid just on time, that's fine otherwise. But even if you get there early, Allah, uh, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should give us the reward for that. But that's actually a very good question. About the two rakahs after entering the masjid, if someone takes wudu inside the masjid, there are two rakahs of wudu as well. Do you pray for? Oh, we did that. What is the exact definition of tahajjud? Is it the prayer we perform before fajr, i.e., sleeping then waking up, or is it prayer after witr? It's actually definitely not prayer after witr. That's not what. That's not the way to categorize tahajjud. Tahajjud is prayer that you do at night, that you do um, at night any time after isha. It could be. Right, that if your intention is tahajjud, the best of tahajjud though is when you sleep and then you wake up in the last third portion of the night. That's the best time to make tahajjud. So it's any prayer that's in the night. Although it's no, it, it could be after witr, but it could also be before the witr. So it's not, it's not. That's not the way you categorize it. It's just what's performed that night. In the Hanafi school, if we do this nafal. I'tikaf, what are the intentions one is to make? Purely that I'm making i'tikaf in the masjid, like I'm restricting myself in the masjid for this time. So it could be for five minutes, it could be for 20 minutes, or it could be for you know half an hour or one hour for the duration of the lecture that you've gone to listen to. You can have the i'tikaf intention. Again, the fact here is that you get on your intention. Regarding witr or tahajjud, my question was most specifically about praying shaf al watr wake up, pray one rakah, then tahajjud even, then odd. So is it fine to pray just one rakat after we wake up for tahajjud? No, absolutely not. In the Hanafi school, that's not permissible anyway. But even in general, the idea of the one rakat is at the end. You make it at the end after you do everything. That's that's where it should it should normally be. Is it okay to pray two rakats nafal after witr prayer uh, besides tahajjud? Is it okay to pray two rakats nafal prayer after witr prayer besides tahajjud? Of course, that's the two light rak'ats, the rak'atayn khafifatayn that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to make. The hadith is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Okay, I guess this is where the rest of the question is. Does the prayer which we miss will be covered or do we have to perform the misprayers as soon as possible? As some people say that if you perform qadai umri, then the misprayers are covered. Qadai umri are misprayers, so I'm not absolutely sure what you're talking about. Uh, or what exactly is your question? Qadai Umri means to perform the misprayers of your of your of your life. And then he says, Wa alaykum salam. Some months uh, some mentions the hadith that there is no prayer after witr, i.e. the witr should be your last prayer and you can't pray anything afterwards. No. What it is is that it says you should make your prayer witr prayer the last of your prayers. It doesn't say that there's no salat permissible afterwards. There was a difference of opinion among some of the Sahaba that if you made witr prayer and then after that you made another nafil prayer afterwards for tahajjud, then it would break your witr prayer, which means you'd have to do your witr again. But th- there's no prohibition of doing witr prayer, uh, sorry, of nafil prayer after witr. The Prophet ﷺ himself used to make two rakats. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And anyway, there is a misconception that if a person prays two rakats with the intention of having all of their misprayers excused on a certain day, then they don't have to make up their real misprayers. No, that's absolutely, that's absolutely wrong. I mean, you have to make your qada prayers. Every fard needs to be made up. Uh, the nafil and the sunnahs do not have to be made up, but every fard does have to be made up. If one has not yet prayed the sunnahs of Fajr and the Jama'at has started, should we pray the sunnah or join the Jama'ah? In the Hanafi school, as long as you can catch the Imam before he finishes the prayer, you should make your sunnah prayers at the back. Because the sunnah prayers of Fajr are the most emphasized of the sunnah prayers. The Prophet ﷺ said, perform them even if you uh, uh, perform them even if uh, horses are to come over you, are to, uh, you know, are to walk over you, basically, trying to show the importance of it. So the Hanafis say that as far as possible, if you can get them in before the Imam finishes the prayer off, then you should get them in. But if you think that you're going to miss the complete Jama'ah, then that's fine. Brother Imran, but from Abu Dhabi, has a plan as well. Okay, mashallah. 
I didn't hear you answer to so tahajjud is any prayer at night with no need to sleep for instance yes if uh, the best of tahajjud prayer is after you wake up but you could actually pray before you go to sleep as well if you're not going to be able to get up that's the student's tahajjud prayer I think Abu Huraira radiallahu anh used to do that if one prays two rakats during the night then sleeps then wakes up uh, then he perform tahajjud during the night after Isha then I sleep and then wake up fajr then he perform tahajjud if he had the interruption to do that yeah if we wake up very late for Fajr, 15 minutes before Shuruq, should we pray Sunnah also? Or is it makruh to pray other than the Fajr Fard? No, until you've got 15 minutes, I mean, if you can get uh, two Sunnahs in there and two Fard in there, of course, uh, you should get your Sunnahs in there as far as possible. Is there a Qadha for the missed Sunnahs? Uh, for Fajr there is, uh, but only until the noon of that day, until Dhuhr of that day, you can actually make Qadha of the two Sunnah Rakats after sunrise. Okay, so we've gone way over time. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.